Welcome back to Flourish. Um, right now we will be having real world development presented by Mark Meeker. I don't think I've ever gotten up here and had somebody clap. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk real world web development. So, show of hands, how many people here actually use um, Linux on a day-to-day on -day basis? Oh, wow. So how many of you have landed on a website and been told that you're using a browser that isn't compatible with whatever they're about to present? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of annoying, um, and it's kind of wrong. I don't like it. Um, so the generic title of, of real world web development uh, really should be something like this, uh, except I didn't think it would fit on a, uh, on a schedule and I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be able to be uh, uh, tweeted. Um, but, but this is what we're talking about. We're talking about building websites, building applications in a, in a way that, that anybody can have access to it. We're, we're sharing content, we're, we're letting people do things you know, and we really want to find ways that it can get to everybody. Now the trick to that is there's some really cool stuff on the web. And there's really cool stuff we want to use. And it's, it's, it's finding that balance and finding a way to still let, let people, you know, get through what they need to do and then give that amazing experience for, for some of these new things that are coming along. Uh, so this is me. Um, I actually started in web development um, by helping launch Britannica.com. They had this crazy idea that you could give an encyclopedia away for free and make money on ads. Uh, that was my introduction to the internet. Um, I've spent time at Critical Mass. It's a, a media agency in which uh, I did uh, kind of technology direction for a number of large clients. Um, and for about six years, I've been working at Orbitz, where um, I've done everything uh, related to the, to the front end or the user interface or the UI. Um, so I started out there as a developer and I'm now the principal UI engineer there. Um, essentially responsible for um, six of our worldwide brands um, and pretty much anything that shows up in the browser uh, ultimately uh, falls under my group. And so that's what I've always done. I've always developed things for the browser. Um, I'm not a fan of, of needing a plugin. The idea of flash and silver light feel wrong to me. Um, I want to make sure that, that whatever we're offering, and whatever we're putting on the web is available to everybody. So I'm guessing, given the number of people here, um, that we probably have more internet connected devices in this room uh, than we do people, given the number of phones and, and, and laptops here. Um, and each one of those probably has at least one browser, maybe two, maybe three. Uh, my laptop here has 18, so I probably skew the curve a little bit. Um, but it's there, it's installed, it's all you need in order to be able to use the web. And that's one of the amazing things about it. Um, and it turns out that one of the guys that, you know, helped define the web, uh, not Al Gore, the other one. Um, so that's kind of the principle and that's kind of the point. He talks a lot about universality. Um, and I actually spoke here two years ago on the topic of accessibility and trying to make the web open and available for people specifically with um, disabilities, whether they be blind, whether they're hard of vision, whether they can't use a keyboard. Um, and this time I'm putting a little bit of a twist on it because even in the past two years with the introduction of mobile and everything else that's been going on, the web has, I think, radically changed and the expectations around it have changed as well. So we still want to be able to have a web in which you don't have to install any software, that you can just use a browser, and it's not dependent on what operating system, or what browser, or what device that you're using. Um, which is all well and good, except there's a lot of them. Um, and developing code for a browser isn't always easy. Um, I don't know how many people here, how many people here have, have built a web page? How many people here have tested that web page in more than one browser? How many people didn't have it work the first time? <laughs> That's the world we're in. Um, there are browser incompatibilities. It's nothing new. It's not going to go away. 
Um, and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk kind of about the current state, where we're at in the browser space, um, what's about to change, and it's already changed. People just aren't taking advantage of it. Um, a little bit of a history, because you have to know kind of where we've been to know where we're going and not make the same mistake again. Um, some tips on how to do this better, a little bit of mobile, and then some resources that you guys can take away with and, 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 and learn on your own. So the kind of the current state. So the current state is there's a lot of choices. Uh, you get to choose your operating system. You can run on Linux, you can run on the Mac. Um, so from there, then, you know, you also get to uh, choose your browser. There are lots of choices. Um, unfortunately, there are certain sites that only work in certain browsers. Um, some are better than others. And some are older than others. And that causes problems, too. And the browser landscape changes. I don't necessarily agree with these stats. I don't think they match up to the real world. But I think, relatively, they, the message that they're trying to, is trying to display is, is consistent. And that over time, the, the browsers that people are using to access your site changes. Um, and in fact, they change a lot. And it's changing faster than ever. So this is a, a very rough diagram of major releases of browsers. Um, and if you look at something like Google Chrome, they're doing a release every six weeks. They're introducing a new version of the browser every six weeks. Firefox is, has, is catching up in that um, and have said they just released version 4. And they're going to be on version 7 by the end of this year. So you're going to start to see radical innovation by the browser vendors, most of them. No? I think they keep changing the uh, key on it or something. Okay. Uh, that's on uh, what, uh, Red Hat 6. Well, they have a, pr they have a pretty good um, uh, bug tracking system, so I have to file one. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the, the, the space and what's moving on the, um, on the desktop space. Uh, you get into the mobile space, um, it's not just iPhone and it's not just Android, as much as people probably would like to deal with just those. Um, you get into BlackBerry, which, with the exception of their newest version, which is now using a WebKit um, browser engine similar to Safari and Chrome, uh, JavaScript almost doesn't work. I would say it doesn't work. Um, and and the web and the you know kind of the mobile space, you get you get a lot of fragmentation. Here again, I don't necessarily agree with the numbers here, but the idea is there's a lot of different devices and they all act differently and they're different sized and they have different capabilities. So when you're serving something in a browser, um, you, there, there's so many, so many different angles that can change. Uh, it could be a, you could have a faster or slow connection or they could be an AT&T user and have no connection. Um, the size of the browser is going to change. People are buying bigger monitors and they're getting smaller phones. And they're expecting to access the same content on both. Um, and that's a huge range of, of possibilities. Um, and just the capabilities that are on these browsers are changing. If you're using something like IE6, that's 10 years old. And the web has changed and what the web is doing is changing. And there are things in there that uh, you know, don't work quite the way something, something newer does. And so I said you know, things, are, things are changing. So if, if we look at some of the things that are changing, I mentioned uh, Firefox 4. It came out about two weeks ago. And it saw 16 million downloads in its first 48 hours. Uh, it's had about 56 million downloads. Um, a lot of major sites kind of consider 2% as the, as the threshold for really supporting a, a browser. Uh, Firefox 4 hit 2% of traffic on most sites uh, within that 48-hour period. Um, and that's saying a lot about how things can change when you wake up in the morning. Um, it's starting to hit the news. Recent article on the New York Times, um, specifically about HTML5 and how um, you know you can start doing things in a browser that's much more application oriented. Um, it's interesting that this is coming from the New York Times. They just spent forty million dollars to put a paywall so that you can subscribe and view their content on the web. 
And one of those mechanisms is absolutely the browser. So if you look at kind of what's changed recently, um, you know, the web and HTML is kind of slow moving, um, has been slow moving. Um, it's been around for 20 years. And not too much has changed. You know, in the early 2000s, we said, oh, we want to move from table design and move more towards um, kind, of, kind of fluid and CSS-based design, giving us a lot more flexibility of display. Um, in 2005, we kind of started dealing with AJAX and making much more dynamic and JavaScript-oriented sites. Um, and now in 2009, 2010, and 2011, we're starting to see uh, browsers start to implement a lot of HTML5 features that browsers can start to take advantage of. But the problem is that's only available in some of these new browsers. Um, and the browser vendors are absolutely uh, latching onto this. Um, so this is the HTML5 Rocks website uh, put out by uh, the Google, Google team responsible for Chrome, talking about all the various features with a whole bunch of different demos that you can play and see some of the new features. Um, I encourage you to go take a, a current browser uh, like Chrome and, and, and go and see, see the different capabilities that exist there. Don't confuse it with this website, slightly different. Uh, Mozilla has, you know, th theirs and, and what they're doing in Firefox 4. Um, Opera is not a browser a lot of people talk about. It's big on the mobile space. Um, it doesn't have huge desktop share, especially in the U.S., but um, they're absolutely pushing the envelope and they're, and they're really helping define what, what the web holds. Um, and of course, Apple has embraced it uh, with Steve Jobs saying that HTML5 is the future. You can debate whether that was and Flash isn't, um, was part of it that he didn't say, but um, he's really going towards that. Um, and, and even Microsoft with, with the release of IE9 um, that they've officially released a couple of weeks ago at South by Southwest, um, you know, they're, they're really starting to embrace it. Um, and so some of those things that, that, that you'd see if you, you started to deal in some of these browsers are some of the capabilities that are open to you that you can start to use, um, include some new HTML tags which are interesting, um, and, and I think you should read up on those. What's a little bit more interesting are, are, are what they're calling web forms and, and more dynamic forms. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the next two are probably what gets a lot of press around kind of embedded video and the idea that you don't have to have a plugin or, you, or have to use Flash in order to use a video, um, and that can be and should be available on every device. Um, and starting to get into some more native uh, 2D and 3D drawing applications um, that are the traditional uh, kind of hold of, of, of Flash and Silverlight. So there's, you know, th there's some of these things. Um, this is just an example of some of the new web form elements um, displayed in Opera. Um, anybody who's ever built a travel site has to build a, a calendar picker in order. I don't know because I haven't dove. I haven't. I haven't dove into it too much. Um, so yeah. So anybody who's uh, who, who's built a travel website or any website that has to deal with dates um, has to build a calendar picker. Um, and the idea is, you know, they they've seen that and they realize it. And there are calendar pickers and there are sliders. Um, there's an ability to 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 mask inputs for telephone numbers um, and things like that. Um, and these are all things that we've been doing on the web in one form or another, but we've had to kind of jump through hoops to do. Um, and they're making it much more native, um, which, is, which is absolutely great. Um, and, and in fact, if you take advantage of some of them today, uh, like different custom inputs, um, if you're on an iPhone or, or an Android device and you bring up a input of email, it will give you a keyboard that's targeted towards email and puts the at symbol um, directly on the, uh, on the keyboard. Uh, if you bring one up that's a, a type of URL, the .com button suddenly appears. And if you do number, it's the number keyboard instead of the other one. If you say it's a phone number, it's actually the phone number one that shows up. So it starts to mask. It makes a much more uh, better user interface, adding some affordances to the, to the inputs uh, that just start to make more sense. Um, some other changes that are, that, that are available 
kind of in some browsers, um, our CSS changes and improvements around selectors, around doing web ty typography and actually being able to use fonts and send the font down to the user um, instead of relying on the system font that they have. Um, a lot of visual treatments, the things that make web developers cringe around rounded corners and gradients and things that we, we do today, but we do it with a lots, of, lots of extra markup and a lot of extra images, slowing down the site and things like that. So uh, the idea of making that easier and making that more native. And that's a pattern that you'll start to see. You'll start to see a lot of the things that are being added and improved upon are things we're already doing. We're just trying to make it more native. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel or anything like that. Um, and transitions and animations. Um, and in some cases, those are actually, you know, by, by building them into the browser, able to take advantage of, of some of the, the, the native graphics support of, of the device. And, you know, JavaScript isn't left out either. It's got, you know, some new selections. It's got the idea of client-side storage, so you don't have to cram everything into a cookie. Um, idea of web workers, um, drag and drop API for files. Um, and probably the most popular one of, of geolocation, which you've probably seen on your phone. You can say, hey, where am I? And it knows exactly where you are. And you can do that on Google Maps now, too, on your desktop. And it'll, it'll show you exactly where you are based on the network that you're connected to. So there are all these really cool stuff. And the first thing everybody wants to do is, is implement it. Um, but first, I want to take a step back and, and look a little bit at, at some history. Um, because if you don't remember the past, you're doomed to repeat it. Um, so we'll get in the Wayback Machine, um, and we'll look at what uh, Netscape displayed Yahoo-like in, I don't know even when this was, um, probably the late 90s. Um, and then we have how it was displayed in Internet Explorer. Um, and you know that was pretty much it. Those were the two browsers. If you got them working in that, you were in good shape. Um, you'll actually notice that the, the background image on both of these are different. Um, a minor thing, but the browsers, one of them set the background to white, one of them set background to gray, and if you didn't set it, you got the default. So, um, And for a long time, Yahoo was actually very proud of the fact that they never set the background color um, and let the browser decide. Um, I think they finally gave up on that. Um, and you know, this wasn't necessarily a pretty time to do web development. Um, those were the two players, and they didn't exactly do things the exactly the, the same way. Um, this is kind of the definition of, of, of cross-browser issues, right? And, and some of you are way too young to remember this, but um, it turns out when people built sites, they actually put these buttons at the bottom of their page um, saying which browser that they were in favor of and which browser that they, uh, they kind of built their site towards or used to test. Um, I know nothing about that. Um, I never did it. <laughs> Um, and you know this was this was the way it was, and actually at this time, um, you know, just just so you know, um, Netscape 3 was a really bad browser, i.e., was actually the better of the two, and had a better market share. Um, but you know, this was one thing. The the other level was people actually would would block browsers, right, and say, "I'm sorry, you're using Netscape. You can't actually see our site." Um, the good ones would say, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty sure that, that it's going to look bad, but we'll let you through anyway. The bad ones would say, sorry, go download another browser. Um, and most of the people on the web don't know how to do that, right? Um, I don't know if you guys, anybody saw um, Hulu's April Fool's joke yesterday. Um, they decided to release a web 1.0 version. Um, and I thought it was really funny, so I had to add this to it, because it actually uses frames. Um, and the interesting thing about frames is, when the web very first started and the two browsers were Mosaic and Netscape, Netscape supported frames, Mosaic didn't. And so if you built a site with frames, you had to block anybody who was coming with, um, with the Mosaic browser. And the way they did that, of course, is they looked at the user agent. So when, you make, when a browser makes a request, it sends a lot of information, it sends your IP address, it sends whether you support gzip, all these other things, and it also sends a, a string defined by the browser if you want to entertain people like me, there's actually a Firefox plugin that you can change this. Um, and I'm always, always entertained by the messages that we, we see in our, uh, our user logs. But anyway, um, this, was, this was what Netscape set theirs to. And of course, IE came along and said, all right, well, we got this browser. And they released it. And it supported frames. But it was being blocked by all of the sites that supported frames. So what do they do? They changed their user agent. 
and they prepended their user agent with the word Mozilla, so that any time a site was looking to say, hey, are you Mozilla? Are you Netscape? It'll pass, and it'll let you through. Yeah, that's not going to end well, right? <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure that's not going to scale, but we'll see in a second. So let's look at some approaches for the future. So that was kind of where we were 15 years ago. Where are we today? Um, and I actually want to touch on some dangerous approaches to the future and, and things that, that you probably don't want to do if you're building a site. Um, and, and, and one thing just to kind of look at is detecting user agents is bad. Um, so these are the user agents of the latest versions of uh, five browsers. You notice that they all start with the word Mozilla. Uh, interestingly enough, they kind of, you know, and Safari came along and Safari said, well, I got to start with Mozilla. And it turns out Safari was being blocked by uh, people who would only support Netscape. So they added a like gecko string to it in ho hopes of, uh, of getting caught there. Chrome came along and said, well, well I'm going to do exactly like Safari did. And in fact, we wanted people to, to think we're like Safari too, so it adds the string Safari in it. Um, one, this isn't maintainable, right? Um, and, and two, you're, you're opting people in by always looking at a, a user agent string to say, I'm going to opt in this browser. Because a new browser comes along and you're going to forget to add the string. Or you're going to parse it wrong. Because nobody would ever do that, right? So this is the user agent string for Opera version 10. You notice the first thing it says is Opera slash 9.80. Well, see, when people do user detection, the only thing that they were looking at was the seventh character of the string when it was Opera. And when they moved to version 10, people were saying, well, we support Opera 6 and above. And 1 is less than 6. Sorry, you can't access the site. So they've now appended their current version to the end, which is fine. You can actually buy commercial uh, software that does web analytics, and a number of them will report that despite Opera now being on version 11, almost 100% of their traffic is version 9.8. And so there are sites that do compatibility checks. So it's tax time. And if you were to go to TurboTax and use Chrome 11, which is an amazing browser with lots of features, it will say, yeah, our developers haven't tested against this, so we're not quite sure it's going to work. This starts to get into being like McDonald's, only allowing Chevrolets to go through the drive through right? It, it really starts to limit your user base. Even worse, Firefox 4 is out, and if you go there today expecting to do your taxes, it won't even let you in. It will inform you that you need to download a browser, including a link to, my, um, to Mozilla Firefox, which will take you to the download of four, version 4.0, which won't work. <laughs> and of course, the browser, the, the, the browser vendors are, are against this, and they, they don't want you to be doing it. Except if you were to go to Apple's HTML5 site in Firefox, this is the message you get. So this isn't good. Um, and it's very rare that I agree with a cartoon, cartoon squirrel. Um, but it is a double standard, and, and, and we really want to move to open standards. And, and so we don't want to do user detection. Um, and we really want to start using some of these new features. And so if we look at them, so this is a pretty interesting site, and each of these axes um, represent a different kind of new feature of HTML5 or CSS3. Um, if you go to the site and you mouse over, it's actually uh, some pretty cool animation going on. And of course, HTML5 and CSS3 is being used. Um, and it'll tell you some different features. And the length of the, of the axi kind of infers support across a number of browsers. Um, and if it were 2008, and you'd look at this and you'd say, well, there's a lot of stuff I can't use. Um, and it slowly starts to get better. Um, and it slowly starts to get better. And it keeps getting better and better. Um, the thing to keep in mind is we're never going to hit 100%. Um, there are browsers out there. There are user agents out there. There are slow machines. There are all of these things that you're never going to find a feature that absolutely works absolutely everywhere. Um, and there's a lot of people think that, that, that feel that you have to have that 100% in order to use a feature. Um, and that's absolutely not true. Um, 
and I hope that if there's one thing you take away, it's the fact that as you're building a site, it's important to make it usable for everybody, but you can enhance it with features um, to, to a subset of those users um, and do it in a way that, that you add those features, um, you know, you, Add those, add those features to the new, so that any new browser that starts to come on just can start to use it. So, so this was uh, some, some responses to a blog about CSS3 features, and the number of people that just kept saying, all of these browsers don't support what you're, what you're suggesting, there's no way we could ever use it. Um, you'll end up building a, a, a site that's out of date and never, and never grows. Um, and, and there's some, you know, certainly some pushes to, to, to get rid of some older browsers. This is a site that, that even that Microsoft actually released. Um, I'm pretty sure when they launched it, um, it probably set the record for the number of who is requests to a single domain to ensure that they actually did own this domain. Um, and it shows you Internet Explorer 6 usage, which is an old browser. It's 10 years old now. Um, usage across the world. And what's interesting is, is people look at it and go, oh, you know, look, the number keeps going down. Um, I look at it and I see China and South Korea and India and some pretty big markets. Um, and, and China's sitting at over 30%, i.e. six usage. Um, so if you're a global company and you expect to be able to um, access and, and, and gain these customers, you, you have to be able to deliver something that works for them as well. So it's a balance. Um, but it's a balance that I think there's ways to, to kind of approach. Um, and so we're going to look at some better approaches. Um, so the first off is, is we need to get the right answer to this question of um, do websites need to look the same in exactly every browser? Um, if you spend your time trying to make a site pixel perfect across every browser, you're going to fail. It's the equivalent of like seven nines uptime, right? The last couple nines um, just aren't worth the effort. Um, so the answer to that question, um, and you can go to the website and find out for yourself, is no. Um, it doesn't need to be pixel perfect. Um, and, and there's, I, I mean, it's, a, it's just a reality. <laughs> you want to make it look good, you want to make it look good as, as, as much as possible in every browser, but um, if, if you think that you're going to take something that, um, you know, this isn't a print world, it's not something where you're creating a site um, and, and just printing it on paper and everybody gets the same experience. Um, and so there are things that, that we can do to kind of understand differences between browsers. Um, one of them is understanding the quirks. Um, and there is a site very aptly named quirksmode.org um, by uh, Peter Paul Koch, which says, you know, there's, what, what he's done is actually cataloged all of the, a lot of different differences in CSS and how they're going to um, manifest themselves across browsers. He's actually been working very hard to do this across mobile. Um, it was a difficult challenge across the desktop browsers. I can't imagine what it's like across mobile. Um, so it's a really useful site. Um, and if you're developing site, uh, sites on a regular basis, something that you, you, you want to make, make sure you're familiar with. Um, there are other sites that kind of give you an idea of, of HTML support across various browsers. Um, but the key with, with a site like this is don't let all of the red X's scare you off from some of these new features. Um, because we still want to start using those new features. Um, browsers, interestingly, display things differently. So if you don't actually apply any HTML or any CSS and you give them raw CSS, uh, or sorry, raw, you don't apply any CSS and you give them raw HTML, things will actually look slightly different because every browser has kind of a default style sheet that it first applies. Um, and in fact, as you try and build sites, that can kind of get in the way. Um, so one way around that is to use something like a CSS reset um, or a baseline that allows you to um, kind of start off with a consistency across every browser. The, the, the one drawback to this is it probably means you're actually going to write some more CSS because you've lost some of those, those, those default settings. Um, but where it's important, this, this tends to add a lot of value. Um, the YUI Yahoo team has, uh, has something similar. Um, uh, Eric Myers was just recently revised. Um, is actually the one that we've uh, we've based the orbits one off of. Um, and note, you're allowed to change these if you don't agree with them. That's one of the great things about the web too, right? You're not locked into any of this code. Um, there are of course JavaScript libraries. Um, these are four of the more po more popular ones. Um, they're all open source. They all do things well. 
albeit in different ways. Um, and, and, and they're all open to you know, new contributions and, and, and things like that. So um, these help to kind of smooth over some of the differences um, so that you can start to implement things in ways that, that, that do work across browsers and, and kind of take that community effort to um, solve some of those problems. Um, but there are other things that, that we want to look at um, because all that does is, is kind of make all, all of those efforts kind of gives you a consistent experience across browsers that are offering kind of consistent capabilities. Um, and that's not always true, right? So uh, I may not have JavaScript on. I may not have CSS. Um, my company may have blocked that. That may, may not be important to you as, you know, as, as somebody who's creating a site and your customers, um, but it might be. Um, and if it is, or even if it isn't, uh, this is actually a very good way of, of building a site and thinking about how you build it. Um, and it's the idea of progressive enhancement in that you actually just start with kind of the raw HTML and, and, and very much focus on the content that you want to display. Um, and then you add your CSS styles to make it look good um, and work in some of these browsers. And then you add some JavaScript um, in order to enhance it and make some things interactive. Um, and it, it, it actually is a, it, you know, is a really big win and, and really starts to, um, if you do it this, if you start doing this and head down this path, uh, you can really start making your site work in, in a lot more uh, different conditions. Um, we've done this on, on, on a mobile site we were building um, for our European brand. Um, and it was, it was a no-brainer when we said, do we need to support BlackBerry? Yes. And oh, by the way, we really, really uh, can't serve at JavaScript. We just didn't. Um, and it worked amazingly well. So it, here's an example of um, Yahoo's TV site, which um, interestingly, shut down yesterday, so you can't actually go and see this anymore. Um, but this is kind of the, you know, Uber interactive view, and you can mouse over things and get highlights and stuff like that. Um, but if you don't have CSS installed, then, or capable, then you just get a nice bunch of data. Um, and it works well. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but, you know, if you're blind and you're using a screen reader, this is actually all you need. Um, and it's in a perfect format for that. Um, and it degrades well. Um, so this is an example of on the Orbit site where um, the top part, as you change your, uh, the country drop down, we change whether we're asking for cities or Providence or, um, or zip codes, and we'll change the state list depending on what country you choose. And we're dependent on, on, on JavaScript for all of that, um, which works well, except when you don't have JavaScript. Um, and so in that state on the bottom, we, we, we serve you a page in which um, we just ask for the freeform inputs. Um, so we, and that's actually the page we start with, and we hand, enhance it with JavaScript to build the other. Um, now, somebody might look at this and say, well, this means that you have to write uh, validation on the back end for that data. Um, and my response to that is you can never trust JavaScript to begin with, so you need to write that validation anyway. Um, if we look at some uh, Design examples, this is actually from uh, Jeremy Keith's site. Um, I don't know how well it shows up on the, uh, on the screen, but the top version actually has kind of a, 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 kind of a physical photo effect where they've added a little bit of box shadow and 3D and, 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 and gradient, um, and the bottom doesn't. Um, and so they've enhanced it for the browsers that have that capability. If you don't, you just don't get it, um, and they didn't go to the trouble of creating massive number of images to achieve that effect. And as the more and more browsers start to support this, the more and more people that will be able to get that top effect without you having to do a thing. Uh, here's another example um, using the famous rounded corners. So the top version has rounded corners, the bottom version not so much. Uh, the top version is doing some other things around text shadow and, uh, and stuff like that. The bottom version is completely usable. In Internet Explorer 6, that's a totally usable website. Those that have a newer, more modern browser, they get that top version. It's a little bit better. These, these same things hold as we, as we start thinking about, about different devices and different inputs. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a desktop site. We run Orbis.com, and we get a tremendous amount of traffic from the iPad. Um, so, so we've started to go through and, and adding various gestures so that you can do, you know, cool swiping and different thumb pinching and things to interact with the site um, that you, you, know, you wouldn't do on your desktop. Um, it's there for those browsers, those devices that have that capability. Um, 
If dust, you know, if suddenly, a, you know, three years from now, everybody buys monitors that are uh, that are touch sensitive, they're going to get that capability too. Um, it's just there. Um, so, you know, if we start talking about or we talk about progressive enhancement, and I mentioned the idea of just kind of removing JavaScript for maybe some older BlackBerry users, or something like that. Um, this is really a concept that Yahoo started, known called uh, graded browser support, um, and they actually start to bucket browsers into different groups. A grade being kind of their, their known knowns, um, the browsers that they get a lot of traffic on and usage on, and that they're absolutely going to, you know, really push that uh, amazing experience too. The, the C grades are the browsers that they know are, are old and decrepit, and they're just going to give that very, very base experience. Um, but the important thing, and what, what differs this approach from kind of what I'll call the TurboTax approach, right, is, is that for anybody else, there's this X grade. Um, and that's the unknown unknowns. And it's assumed that those are going to work. Um, this is actually Yahoo's most recent list. Um, and you'll actually see that Linux is absolutely nowhere on here. Um, they have two versions of iOS, but they do not mention Linux. But Linux falls into that X-grade support in which they say, you know what, we're going to assume it works. We're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Until somebody comes to us and reports that it doesn't work and it starts to drive customer service calls or something like that, we're going to let you do your thing. It gets to a point that you know three users are, are continue to call because something doesn't work and, you're, and it's an old browser. We'll maybe put that in a C grade browser or something like that. So um, they've done that. Um, the jQuery team has done something similar um, with their their new mobile uh, jQuery mobile UI, and um, they've they've acknowledged something um, that I, that I tend to agree with, and that there's there's probably some middle ground between all or nothing, um, especially in the mobile space. Um, and so they've actually introduced kind of a B grade, um, and starts you know that starts to starts to make sense as we see how kind of mobile is is, is shaping up. Um, so so these are all good, but they're all kind of these all or nothing things, right? Um, and we start talking about HTML5, all of those features. It's kind of a every single feature. It's different as to what their support looks like, um, and that's where kind of the idea of of feature detection comes in. Um, and you actually want to Check for a capability before using it. This avoids browser detection. This allows you to, to narrow in on, on very specific features if you want to use geolocation, if you want to use offline storage and things like that. And say, hey, does this, is this browser that I'm, I'm using you know, have it? And if it does, then I'm going to go ahead and use it. Um, and there's a couple of libraries out there that, that support this. Modernizer is one. Um, and if you actually go to their site, it'll actually tell you kind of what it's detected that your browser supports. Um, so I did this in Safari. The most recent version, so I get a lot of green check marks. Um, you know, because what might only work for 10% of the users today will be 20% of tomorrow. And as people continue to upgrade, they'll just continue to get to to take advantage of these features. Um, here's a the the Nissan Leaf um, website. Uh, if you actually go to it, um, it's an incredibly interactive um, display. And in fact, if you're on a uh, something like Chrome, it's all in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Um, but if you're on an older browser or something like that, um, it actually falls back to Flash. So you, you have the ability of kind of building it one way and then falling back as well, if it's something that you, that you deem to be very important. Um, so I'll touch on mobile kind of briefly. Um, it's new, but it's moving a whole lot faster than desktop, um, and it's got a higher expectations because it's new. Um, and I would include, um, you know, tablets kind of in the same space, the iPad and, and various Android tablets. Um, and, and when we start to, to get into this, um, we also see a lot more differences. Screen size is different. The bandwidth is different. Um, and it's suddenly not an all or nothing game. Um, what might work on, uh, on a seven-inch tablet doesn't work on a, on a three-and-a-half-inch iPhone. Um, and so the idea of a one-size-fits-all doesn't necessarily work. Um, you know, we want to make it more flexible, and, and scroll bars and zooming in and out isn't really flexible. Um, so this is, this is the hacker's new, Hacker News site for Y Combinator. Um, and I tend to read this over lunch, and I tend to have my iPhone. Um, and it's, while it's readable on that, it's not readable on my uh, on my small iPhone. Um, and so what I end up having to do is I end up having to zoom in, 
in order to click links and look at all of the content. And then I have to zoom back out in order to go look at other li links or I got to kind of scroll back and forth. Um, and it's kind of really bad experience. Um, but the problem is they can't just build a site that's 350 pixels wide or 320 pixels wide to fit the iPhone. Because um, in fact, you find that there's a huge number of different uh, screen widths out there. Um, and so how do you kind of deal with all of them? Um, one idea that's out there is the idea of responsive design. Um, it's just starting out, um, but it uses the idea of media queries. If you're familiar with print style sheets, it's kind of the same thing where you can start to apply some differences based on, on certain properties. Um, because you can't really tailor fit to every screen, but you can start to make some, some, some changes and tweaks. I mean, these are two very different experiences when you're on a small phone versus a full desktop site. Um, so this is actually the uh, Chicago Tribune Election Center website. Um, and this is how it looks if you were to open it up on a desktop on a 1,200, uh, 1024 wide screen. If you were to suddenly make your screen smaller or only be on an 800 by 600 monitor or being on a, uh, a iPad, um, it will automatically uh, pull itself in, resize the images, um, and, and, and kind of give you much more of a tailored experience. If you're on a phone, it goes even more, more so. Um, at this point, it actually removes the ads. So I highly recommend this view. Um, but you know, the idea is it's saying, oh, well, you're, you're, we know you're in a, a very, very thin view. You know, let me tailor it more. Um, this works amazingly well for content sites. Um, I don't know how well it works for kind of application-oriented sites, um, but I'm really interested in finding out. Um, there, there's a site out there, um, Media Queries, with the .es being um, part of the, doma you know, the domain, and it has a whole bunch of examples out there. Um, most of them are very content-oriented. Um, but, but still, you know, interesting to look at and, and peruse. Um, but also note, this isn't, you know, this isn't kind of a silver bullet either, because there are a lot of mobile browsers that don't support this. But it's a nice feature that you can add that as more and more mobile browsers do, they can start taking advantage of it. Yep. Okay. Um, so I wanted to give you a, a couple resources because I ran through a whole bunch of stuff really, really quick. Um, you know, if you're, you're building across multiple browsers, um, one of the best things you can do is see how it works in each browser. Um, Firefox has a Firebug plugin, and there are um, developer tools that, that come installed in all of the other browsers, um, and Opera has, has a tool called Dragonfly. Um, if you're kind of doing things that, that require a lot of kind of tr uh, chatter back and forth between your site and a server, um, having something that actually can, can look at that and see what requests are going back and forth is, is really valuable. Um, Fiddler on, on Windows, um, Charles on the Mac, and a uh, HTTP Fox plugin for Firefox that will work everywhere. Um, and if you're, you know, really good at the uh, command line, you can just uh, find ways to sniff on the traffic yourself. Um, Cross-browser testing, it's hard, it's pain, um, there's no way around it. I have like six virtual machines on this Mac, um, it's the only way that I can do it. Um, but if you're on Windows, um, Microsoft actually offers various um, what they call compatibility images, which are 90-day period uh, virtual machines that you can run. It only works on actual Windows hardware, though. Um, there are emulators out there for you know Android and, and um, the Opera browser and things like that. Um, Keynote has a tool called Mite, which is is interesting, although not really an emulator. Um, if you're interested in kind of the breadth of, of of mobile data, there's an open source project called Werfel. Um, that is literally a library of almost every phone that is out there and hundreds of properties for each of those phones. Um, Facebook relies on this pretty heavily um, and has done a lot to contribute to it, um, so it's only starting to grow. Um, it's up on SourceForge. Um, if you want to learn HTML5 cheaply, um, there's a free web book out there that is continually updated by Mark Pilgrim. Um, and dive into html5.org. 
um, some good books. The first one is kind of just the seminal book on web standards. Um, the others are also equally good. Um, I don't know why they're almost all green, but they are. Uh, if you have a friend that's or a company that still uses IE6, I encourage them to or you to install Chrome Frame on their machine, which will actually give them the Chrome, the new Chrome rendering engine inside of IE6. You don't actually need admin permissions to install it, um, so knock yourself out. If you visit Orbits with it, um, you will actually uh, be visiting Orbits in Chrome inside of IE6. Um, I like things that are open. Um, you should too. And uh, you know, don't build to the lowest common denominator, but still support it and then grow on it uh, using open technologies. Um, but whatever you do, just go out and build something. Uh, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. devices lose out on that experience because the best they can do is 